Hello everybody, uh, welcome to the Nova School webinar this afternoon on building IT resilience. Um, my name is Ian McClure, I'm a pre-sales technical consultant um, working at Nova School. Um, today we are delighted to present uh, uh, another webinar in our Let's Talk series. Um, today our, our subject is um, building IT resilience. Before we get into the first uh, couple of slides, I'd like to thank uh, obviously yourselves for joining the uh, webinar this afternoon. Um, and also I'd like to thank um, our partners at uh, Zerto. Okay, let's let's dive in and, <clears throat> and discuss the, uh, the agenda for, for today's uh, webinar. I'd like to cover off um, just some slides around uh, how IT has evolved. Then we'll talk uh, around uh, what's happening um, currently in uh, the world of the digital transformation and some of the uh, projects and things that people are, are, are currently focusing on. We'll talk about the various types of um, IT disasters that we've all either heard about or have had some first-hand experience with. What we'll then get into is um, a conversation, a discussion around a uh, product that uh, meets um, all of these uh, these challenges that we uh, that we face. We obviously were back in the days we had physical servers. Everybody will remember uh, you had a single piece of hardware with their various operating systems, predominantly Windows installed, and it was very much a one application, one physical server. Uh, and then you had racks and racks of these things in your in your data center. So it was a one-to-one -one relationship. And in terms of disaster recovery, that was very challenging in terms of replicating that to a disaster recovery site or a second site because you had to effectively mirror the exact one-to-one -one relationship uh, with your application servers. Then we moved into the virtualization era and that's where in the data center we saw consolidation. We saw virtual machines running, uh, multiple virtual machines running on single server hardware, uh, which again reduced the amount of physical servers. Um, so we've got virtualization. We've got virtualization where we have multiple virtual machines running on the hardware. So we've consolidated um, hardware and consolidated the equipment uh, running in our uh, data centers. Then we've recently moved into the era uh, where we've got software-defined data centers. And with software-defined data centers, we effectively have, have seen the introduction of um, technologies, things like um, VMware Virtual SAN. So we can, we can run our workloads across um, standard server hardware without the need to have shared storage specific arrays and, and, and expensive equipment in the data center. It also gives a higher amount of flexibility within the data center solutions because we have the ability to run the, the network configuration and, and other uh, in, environments um, in the data center um, as a software-defined solution. Most recently, obviously, we, we've, we've um, had the introduction of, of public and private cloud. So a lot of customers are now running their VMware in what they call their own private cloud. It's their own data center cluster within <clears throat> the data center environment. We also have players um, in the market now um, the likes of AWS and Microsoft with their Azure platforms. And those are our are, are current sort of public um, cloud offerings. So again, workloads can be in the private cloud. They can be in the um, public cloud running in, in Azure or, or AWS, or they can be a mix of both. Uh, and that's typically what uh, customers are doing there. They're spreading their workloads around the different um, options they have uh, for the for the uh, running the workloads. So transformation, transformation um, is 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 something that uh, this particular comment from IDC indicates that a lot of businesses are looking at this um, in terms of the applications, in terms of how they 
currently deliver their their IT solutions out to um, out to their customers or their their end users. A digital transformation is being helped by the the variety of different solutions that are out there in terms of the um, public uh, and private cloud solutions, whether it be on premise or or pushed up into um, a data center. So why why is this transformation happening? Um, it's all about being dynamic and flexible. It's about um, looking at the profitability. Um, companies are developing ways of, of increasing their financial revenue and also trying to make themselves stand out um, from their um, competitor organizations. So um, it's to give themselves competitive edge, but also as well deliver um, the best service that they can for the um, for the customer uh, or for the uh, end users. And the other thing that the digital transformation um, is delivering is a speed to market. So accelerate the innovation inside the business, getting these new types of application deployed uh, and pushed out and in use um, in, in a much quicker time. Um, <clears throat> some people will remember the, the projects that take years and by the time they get ruled out, uh, there's their competitors are, are ahead of the game or they've been slow to get the applications out. So the new world is effectively saying, let's let's just you know develop these applications. Um, we have the tool sets now, the mechanisms to push them out, get them, get them running in the environment. So some of the challenges that are um, around the, the transformation, from a technology perspective, one of the major challenges is the fact that there are multiple technologies that um, can be deployed. Most conversations that we have um, involve, you know, should we or shouldn't we be pushing some of these applications into some form of club, uh, public cloud space? Uh, should we developing them and running them on our own um, and that's from a technical perspective that's before you get into the conversations around data where it sits and all the regulatory stuff um, that uh, seems to be um, very prevalent at the minute. There's also the customer experience so it's how do you ensure if you're running your applications inside a public cloud how do you make sure that the connectivity is right um, that you've got the right uh, performance from those applications. Um, you don't necessarily have underlying control of those platforms in terms of the hardware. So you have to um, work um, and, and make sure that you've tested and fully deployed the applications um, in those new um, types of uh, infrastructure. Whenever we first started working with customers and developing um, disaster recovery solutions. We deployed solutions based on um, VMware and based on um, storage array replication. And it was quite an expensive project if you were deploying some form of disaster recovery. So on that basis, a lot of customers took a subset of their application set and, <clears throat> and deemed those the mission critical applications to their organization. And those are typically things like their email, um, their main finance applications, the things that they needed to, to run that were the more critical than, than the rest of the other smaller applications that maybe don't get utilized uh, as in the same, the same level. Today, a lot of those conversations now have changed. Um, the conversations now are, are around everything critical. Um, everything is critical to the business. Um, there's no applications in there that we, you know, can't live without. Um, therefore, you know, let everything fits into that um, business critical category. Um, and therefore, we want all of those replicated or made highly available across our current um, IT infrastructure. Disruptions. Um, <clears throat> we've all seen the disruptions that have happened, either uh, first-hand experience or uh, in the press with various companies that have that have had outages that should have affected uh, many consumers. Um, so we have unplanned uh, disruptions. So a user does something wrong or an admin person 
um, <clears throat> makes a mistake, uh, pulls the wrong cable in a data center, or um, there's, there's issues with um, parts of the uh, infrastructure. So these are all unplanned infrastructure failures. We've also seen many reports uh, around the um, security and ransomware, so data potentially being um, encrypted and uh, <coughs> companies held to ransom for um, financial gain um, to uh, get their data unlocked and pushed back out. And also you have natural disasters that can affect your, your own private cloud sites, um, et cetera. But um, that means the systems aren't, on, aren't available. We also have disruptions um, that are planned. So mergers and acquisitions where we would um, uh, be consolidating applications, moving users from one company into another company, consolidating their IT systems. Those all require downtime because they, they effectively, data has to be transitioned from one location to another. We also have people moving to, to obviously their cloud infrastructure. So as they migrate users um, into, the, into the cloud, into maybe Office 365, or some other um, cloud-based application, there's time to effectively move the data from their current application into the cloud application. Data center consolidation, again, with a lot of virtualization, everybody is uh, considering um, consolidating down the number of data centers they have. Again, data has been moved from A to B, and um, the, the, uh, the, the upshot is, is that there's, as part of those projects uh, in organizations, there's, there's time where there's planned downtime effectively from, from an application perspective. A really big one actually on this list is the maintenance and upgrades. We do believe this year is going to be a, a huge year for, um, for updates, particularly for hardware, but also software as well, your patching etc um, with some of the um, technology and hardware processors um, at the minute it's hard to to not see how there's going to be an increased amount of, of patching um, needing needing applied and that also relates to the security stuff as well so security um, I, I, a great deal of that is is around um, ensuring that um, you've got the right patches deployed and again, that's part of your, your ongoing planned um, downtime maintenance, et cetera. So there's not just natural disasters that we, we're really focusing on or really need to worry about. Uh, there are a number of other things that can be uh, attributed to, um, to a disaster, apart from a natural disaster per se. So a high percentage of them are things to do with um, power failures. So that could be power failure to your own um, server, uh, server room or data center. Um, failures in the hardware. We see a lot of disruptions in terms of network outages, whether that be at the data center or whether that be at your branch locations where, where they're connecting into the, to the applications and services. Failures in software. Um, that could be versions of an application that are pushed out, uh, haven't been fully tested in the, in the live production environment or the test environments, and therefore um, have caused outages or, or issues with applications. We're all human. Humans make errors as well. So there are, there are things that, that, that are introduced um, from a disaster perspective that are caused by humans. Um, there's a, there's a list of considerable amount of other things as well. But, you know, in fact, you know, a, a large number of companies, as the slide says there at the bottom, one in three companies has declared a disaster in the last five, in the past five years. So it may not be a natural disaster, but it, but it, it, you could be um, victim or subject to any of the other failures that, that are on that slide. So, we we'll talk about IT resilience. So again, we're back. We we have the list of of um, unplanned, unplanned. Um, so these are the things that we need to focus on and think about in terms of designing 
our IT resilience. Um, it's thinking about um, the maintenance. It's thinking about infrastructure failures. It's thinking about the security and the ransomware um, are, are really important things. So <clears throat> the reactive stuff on the left-hand side, uh, and then we have the proactive issues on the, the right-hand side of the slide. To, to, tr to accelerate the transformation by adopting change while we protect business from disruptions. So this is all about the journey that we're making in terms of the digital transformation. But as we go from our on-premise data centers, wherever it is, into the cloud, we still, the problem doesn't go away. We still need to ensure that um, we protect the business um, uh, and make sure that IT um, is, is always on. Um, as far as the business and the users are concerned. So we'd like to introduce now uh, Zerto. Zerto is a product um, that Novasco have been using uh, for a number of years. Um, and we have had um, very successful deployments and customer um, feedback and experiences from using this product. Um, particularly in the disaster recovery space. So Zerto work with a number of, of, of major IT partners. Um, I suppose the main ones there on that slide would be VMware. Um, and also um, you can see now they, they have got good relationships working with um, Amazon AWS, Microsoft as well with their um, Azure platform. So Zerto has been deployed um, worldwide um, across uh, a large number of customers and, and uh, is delivered by uh, many, many partners. So Novusco are obviously one of those partners that have engineers um, skilled up in the um, Zerto technology. We also offer our own managed service around disaster recovery. So we call that our disaster recovery as a service. What that allows us to do is wrap around um, a Zerto protection solution um, and we can either uh, um, <clears throat> configure that to go to the customer's own dedicated disaster recovery site or we can take that into our own platform as well and we offer a data center service where we can replicate the um, infrastructure too. So a dive into to Zerto and its, and its platform. Um, it delivers um, the continuous availability, um, always on customer experience. So it's giving you the level of comfort that your data, your live data is, is re residing in another location. Uh, it's continually available. Uh, if your main site fails, you can fail over to your disaster recovery site. You can also fail if any particular application fails, you can roll it um, from the continuous availability back into the main site and uh, keep the applications running 24 seven. Workload mobility is, is a very interesting one because what we're saying there is, um, <clears throat> you no longer are a situation where you have everything running in one data center. You may have applications split across multiple data centers and you may have applications running in um, a cloud provider um, environment. So the mobility is really about giving the IT guys the power or the company, the organization power to say where the applications run. If we wanna move those applications for a small period of time, while we're doing maintenance or whatever, we have the tools to actually get those applications moved from one site to the other site and back again once we've completed whatever it is we're, we're um, challenged to do. We also then have the multi-cloud agility. So <clears throat> again, workloads can be moved up into a cloud provider um, that, that those workloads can run there for a period of time. And once those workloads um, are complete or we don't, don't require them anymore, we can bring them back down to our own premise or, or whatever we need to do. So there's, there's flexibility and it's not just tied to a specific one cloud provider solution. 
you can shop around. Um, <clears throat> you can work out who's got the, the best rates based on what the workload is that you want to run. And <clears throat> you can have the ability then to move the data as and when um, you need to do that. So in terms of the platform, um, how does it provide its resilience? It provides its resilience with a continuous data protection. It has application consistency grouping. So we can take up uh, every application normally has a number of um, dependent servers or services that, that runs that application. So for example, um, a web application would have web servers, it would have load balancers, it would have um, possibly a database, SQL, backend server, um, it has some sort of uh, authentication as well. So all of these services can be grouped into um, consistency groups and allow you to replicate the entire consistency group. So you've got an entire application um, grouped together, which can be moved then um, between um, locations. You've journal-based recovering. So what you can do is you can, you can decide if you need to fill back an application, you can look back over a 30-day um, journal time, time slice, and you can pick a time or date within that 30-day range when, when you want to do the restore point from. Um, <clears throat> so that's useful uh, in a scenario where maybe you've ha been victim of a malware attack um, <clears throat> and some of your data has been encrypted. It takes a while <clears throat> to figure out when the data was encrypted. So you may not be rolling back to the last 10 minutes. You might be rolling back to you know, the previous hour um, where your last sort of safe copy of, of data was before the um, virus came in and uh, encrypted your data. Also has the ability to have long-term retention then. So again, you can have those journals uh, and you can roll back to the, the longer term retention if, if that's something that's required. But sitting on top of this, Azurdo also offers the multi-cloud solution, the workload mobility and the, the non-disruptive um, orchestration and automation. So <clears throat> it's, it's, it's great having a tool that does your replication. It's great having a tool that does all the journaling and setting up your applications. But what you really want is um, that pane of glass, I suppose, that you can look at um, and manage that and make sure everything is automated and automated from a perspective of determining how your current machines are replicated, what is their current recover point objective um, on those machines based on your network and, and so forth. So it's all there as a, as a management tool to, to view. Um, <clears throat> and as well as that, then there's the analytics and the controls. Again, that's very important to, to understand what the current state is of your environment. Um, when you're talking about disaster recovery, you're always talking about when was the last time we completed a failover? How did that failover work? Well, the analytics and the control and all the automation give us the ability to test it, but also to see how the, how the various applications are, are performing um, and how they would perform inside the, the DR. So <clears throat> protect, transform, innovate, um, continuous availability, uh, we have data protection, we can pr protect against ransomware attacks, we can protect against any outages and disruptions. Mobility, we, want, we may want to, let's say we've had a, a customer specifically that was um, renovating and putting new equipment into their primary data center across a weekend. So they migrated their virtual machines across um, into their DR server, their second server room, refreshed over the weekend the, um, the primary server room, and then filled everything back um, all in all in the space of one to two days. Um, <clears throat> consolidations and migrations, again, moving applications from, from one site to another, um, we can handle that, but also providing copies of the infrastructure to do um, testing of new applications or new patching. Again, that's something we have done specifically with 
a number of customers, so they've had patching cycles um, for their Windows environment. Uh, what we have done is we have fired up uh, copies of their production environment in their DR site. DR site sitting there with um, storage and compute that, that generally isn't being used on a day-to-day -day basis. So they can spin up the test version of their applications on their servers in that environment. And then they can apply the patches test to make sure that the patches haven't affected any of their applications. And once they're happy, they can then go back and patch their um, production environment. Multi-cloud agility, again, integration with um, cloud, other cloud providers, um, being able to, to switch workloads across the, um, the on-premise and the, the uh, hybrid cloud, multi-cloud scenarios, um, and then looking at your analytics. So if you've got applications replicated to and running in different locations, clouds, private cloud, uh, on-premise, et cetera, um, you can you can see one pane of glass again um, across all of the all of the applications and where they're where they're currently running. Briefly, just touch on this one. This slide gives us um, you know some sort of idea. Obviously, this is US and it's based on a um, hundred million um, annual revenue turnover of a company. Um, but to put in perspective. Um, you know, you've got at the top there, you've got your daily backup. So if you're relying on a single daily backup of your data each day, if you have a disaster, um, you know, you're, you're feeling back to um, at most um, 24 hours previous data. So you can lose up to 24 hours worth of new data um, when you have a failure. And secondly, then it, you know, the time to actually do that recovery, you're you're bringing data back off disk or some sort of backup storage devices. So that's going to take time to bring and uh, provision those uh, that environment back up again. So it's it's very costly to the business. Storage replication is obviously better than the backup because you've got uh, a second copy uh, at a second site. But it takes time to put those services back back in place because you've got to marry up the server, uh, sorry, the storage based replication with the virtual machines and provision that in your DR and, and bring that up. There's a lot of manual tasks um, when when you're when you're trying to rebuild an environment. With the Zerto virtual replication, um, you know, we, we can see um, <clears throat> applications and, and customers up and running uh, in minutes. Um, we have had experience of that, of customers feeling over and it tends to be um, in the event of an actual disaster, it tends to be more about getting people in the right place um, if the main site has gone down and getting them connected into the network. Um, in the meantime, Zerto has already done its job. The applications are up and running uh, in the data center uh, or the, the DR site. And uh, as soon as users connect, um, the applications are ready uh, and waiting for them. So to, minim to minimize the impact, rewind and recover um, anything in minutes from any point in time direct to the production or recovery site. So traditionally, um, the replication uh, was done at a storage level. So if anybody remembers first versions of um, the VMware Site Recovery Manager, uh, it worked with very specific storage array technologies. Um, and it, it effectively plugged in the software, plugged in the virtual center software, plugged into your storage arrays, but the storage arrays were responsible for replicating the LUNs on your storage across to your disaster recovery site. So um, that, that was quite slow. What it also meant was you, you effectively had to mirror the same type of storage in site A with site B. Um, you you couldn't you know you couldn't mix and match your your storage types even within um, a specific uh, storage vendor. Um, you certainly couldn't replicate between different vendors. Um, so whenever you were buying your infrastructure, you had to buy the same equipment for for both sites, uh, which effectively meant 
uh, double the cost. What Zerto does is it takes the storage um, replication and it moves it up into the hypervisor stack. So it's a software defined replication and recovery solution. The solution um, <clears throat> works effectively on your, your host servers um, and doesn't rely on any storage to storage uh, replication. So in terms of the, the practical side and how this, how this works, um, what we see is two virtual centers, two data centers, set up your virtual machines, um, you install the virtual, uh, virtual monitor, which plugs in on both sides to your virtual center. The virtual replication appliance deploys on each of the host servers to manage the virtual machines on each of the hosts. The virtual machine then tracks the changes to the blocks of data in each of the virtual machines and sends that across the uh, WAN connection to the DR site. The data is then pushed down into the um, disks on your storage. So one of the, the real benefits of doing this is that you don't have to have the same type of storage on, on each site. So because it's software um, replication, it, it doesn't matter. The, 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 the storage equipment could be from completely different storage vendors on each site or one site you could be using um, a Dell solution with EMC storage. The other site you could be using some sort of vSAN uh, virtual storage or some sort of um, hyper-converged infrastructure. Storage doesn't have to be the same. The compute doesn't have to be the same. The only common thing is it just needs to have the, 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 the hypervisor um, installation. So use cases then, obviously uh, one to many replication use cases. You can replicate from your production site to your disaster recovery site. Your disaster recovery site may well be something like Microsoft Azure. In the case of Microsoft Azure or one of any of the public clouds, what you're actually saying there is we're paying the public cloud for the storage. We don't pay for any compute um, in the public cloud until such times as we turn it on. So if you want to test it, obviously you've got to pay for the time that you're running those virtual machines in the cloud. Um, but when you turn it off, you're just paying for the storage uh, of the uh, replicated data. And one of the great things about the solution, obviously, is the ability for you as an organization, once you've deployed it to evidence um, the tests, how often you do it. So some companies may have to do this for insurance purposes, or there may be some other regulatory requirements for the organization. Um, once you've done the test in, in Zerto um, or, or live failovers, um, it's all audited, it's all recorded. Um, you can provide reports for any third parties that need, um, need evidence to do this. So again, this is something that a lot of customers use because um, they're, they're continually asked about when auditors come in to audit their infrastructure from a financial and an IT perspective. You know, they, they are asking, you know, about backups, they're asking to see um, when, disaster, when um, the disaster recovery plans were last test, uh, uh, tested and what was the, um, you know, what was the outcome. And again, it's a case of the more you test these failovers scenarios, the more things that you can, you can understand about the infrastructure and understand how to, <clears throat> how to fix and tweak it. Uh, and make it uh, make it more um, of a, um, I suppose, <coughs> um, foolproof solution. But things are always changing, so it's it's continue. You know, it's a it's a it's a cycle of testing your DR uh, and moving that around. Last slide. Um, thank you very much, everybody, for for your time for joining us today. 
and um, I hope this will be useful. I believe we've got this um, session recorded, so if anybody wants to go back and review, um, that's fine. And if we have any questions, um, you can let us know um, or contact your Novisco account manager um, and we can have any further follow-up questions or discussions. Thank you very much.